اكتساح مارسه الفكر الفلسفي بوقفاته التأملية لقضايا الإنسان واضعا بصماته على صفحات الخلود التاريخي متجاوزا زحف الزمان وحدود المكان بدلالات غزيرة لمفاهيم مشبوكة فسيفسائية تستجدي إجابات حول الصيرورة المتموجة حياكم الله مشاهدينا إلى هذا الحوار الفلسفي التأملي المعرفي مع دكتور كلود سباك أستاذ مساعد في الفلسفة ورئيس قسم الفلسفة وعلم الاجتماع في جامعة السوربون أبو ظبي ويلكم دكتور كلود and thank you for being with us on Fushaira TV Thank you very much for uh, inviting me First, uh, how do you read the message behind organizing the Fujairah International Philosophy Conference by the Philosophy House on the third week of November, which coincides with the International Philosophy Day? Well, I see it as uh, a very strong sign that the UAE authorities are encouraging the development of philosophy uh, not only in the academic world, but outside academia, in the whole of society. And I think it's extremely important and an extremely important message that uh, the UAE is sending and that Philosophy House is working for and uh, being the, the advocate of the, uh, this idea that philosophy needs to be developed, that we need to have young generations especially of um, young people f doing philosophy, learning how to think critically. And uh, I think that is indeed absolutely essential uh, in order to start uh, or to continue tackling some of the m biggest challenges uh, that are uh, to be met uh, in this uh, changing world exactly. uh, and exactly. to face the new problems also that are emerging and that need minds that are able to think in a broad way mm -hmm. out of the box is the way I like to emphasize to my own students in order to make sense of these problems that are unprecedented problems. Actually, this takes me to my second question because the conference uh, framework includes um, a lot of vital uh, topics which emphasize one main theme, philosophy and uh, the present. Based on what you have just mentioned, what's the importance of philosophical thinking in our contemporary times? I think, first of all, philosophical thinking is the core of our human spirituality. We are all born as philosophers. We all have a questioning outlook on the world. We need not only to look for solutions, we need to ask questions. And Maybe we all raise up philosophical questions, but we don't um, uh, own the philosophical tools. Exactly. And so once we have acknowledged our philosophical openness to the world, we need tools, we need conceptual tools, and those tools have been passed down to us through tradition, through a, his a long history of philosophical and scientific thinking that uh, we need to profit from, and for that, philosophical education is uh, necessary uh, and will always be uh, needful for us to be able to make better sense of the problems that we are carrying with our very spiritual outlook onto the world. And so it's important for that to train our minds into t thinking philosophy, philo philosophically with these tools. But uh, you believe that philosophical situation nowadays is somehow different. In what sense, how, and why did that happen? Well, each, each epoch in history brings its own philosophical problems. Now, what is interesting in our epoch, and that has not been only true for this epoch, it has been true for a certain number of centuries now. Each generation for a certain number of centuries is very much aware of the fact that questioning our own historical situation is part of what philosophy has to do. Philosophy is not only about questioning about why is there a world rather than nothing? Why do, why do we exist? Uh, these kinds of very broad questions. There is a, a very important sense in which we need to know 
what is going on in the present. Mm -hmm. The present is a philosophical question for us, and it has been the case, and that's what I try to show in my paper today, it has been the case since modernity. And a special moment in modernity that we'll was called the that. Enlightenment. Yes, exactly. We will come to that afterwards. Yeah. But let's say that we live, we have been living in, a, in an epoch which has been there for a few centuries, perhaps, where the question of our present situation in history is of philosophical importance for us. We mm -hmm. need to know what we are here for, what do we need to do, what is our legacy, and what are the problems that we have to um, uh, uh, solve, and what situation of the world do we have to leave for our own children. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, how could we raise awareness uh, about philosophy across nations, or maybe in other words, what are the factors that might enhance philosophical thinking nowadays in particular? Well, that was a, a question that was raised um, this, this morning at the conference. I think uh, my answer that I gave this morning, I would, I would probably give the same answer now, which is the importance of education. Mm -hmm. Education is the key to raise uh, awareness, now, education also needs educators, and educators need uh, themselves to learn how to use the philosophical tools that we have been talking about. So I guess for this awareness to be possible, one needs thinkers that are ready to go through this long tradition of historical thinking that has passed down to us ever since Greek philosophy started with Plato, Aristotle, and even before them, the pre-Socratics. I think it's always important to go back that way in order to understand even the origin of the concepts that we have and that we use, um, which generally, what, whatever the language in which we are philosophizing, um, have common roots. And I strongly believe I strongly believe that um, philosophy is always able to pass the test of translation. Mm -hmm. It's always possible to philosophize using concepts from other language. They can be translated. Of course, it's not always easy to translate a concept that you find in French into English or from Arabic into French, but conceptuality is much more than perhaps literature open to translation. And for that, there is a, a term for that, which is hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. Her, to, to think in a hermeneutical way is to think in a way that is interpretive of the, the concepts that we are using and that always have something foreign. We need to translate ourselves into the concepts that we are already using, but that we don't necessarily understand because of the long history that has made them travel until us, and we need to interpret that long history uh, whereby the meaning of the words that we have has been constituted. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. How can philosophy help the new generations in having rational thinking, maybe to defend their beliefs? Okay, here I would, I would say that philosophy is rational thinking. So, the question boils down as to how can rational thinking help the young generation exactly. be rational? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to Because jump I into believe, it. you believe that all children are philosophers by nature. I think that all, all and you've human mentioned beings that. have rationality as a potential. The Greek word for, for I mean, rationality comes from a Latin word, which is ratio. And ratio is itself a translation of a Greek word that is logos. Uh -huh. And the Greeks defined the human being as zoon, logon, ekon, the animal endowed with logos, with reason, with language, with the ability to be open in, a, in an interrogative way, in a conceptual way, in an understanding way to the world. And so from that perspective, you see, one could also define the human being as the philosophical animal. And I think that is very important because one has to understand that philosophy is not 
a discourse that one can do after one has done something else, another discourse. After one has done our mathematics class, one can do philosophy. After one has gone to, uh, I don't know, uh, the supermarket, one can do philosophy. No, the way we do mathematics, the way we do biology, the way we even run our ordinary lives is in an interrogating way, is carried through from beginning to end by the philosophical outlook. Mm -hmm. And you have many philosophers to say that. For, for, for science, it's obvious. When you are doing mathematics, when you are doing physics, when you're doing biology, you are trying to understand the world. And that um, the, uh, search for scientific knowledge is itself based on our philosophical outlook. Mm -hmm. And for a very long time, the sciences were all considered under the to be umbrella of philosophy. under the umbrella exactly. of philosophy. Exactly. Not even under the umbrella of philosophy, but uh, phil they were all parts of philosophy. Mm -hmm. See, there, there, there was no uh, umbrella outside the, the sciences uh, care or uh, protecting them. They were all ramifications, branches of the philosophical tree. Exactly. And that has been a bit forgotten because of the specialization of sciences. Now, sciences are and, so specific and, uh, and so specialized yeah. that you you need to have people trained in each science. But for a long time, each scientist was at the same time a philosopher. In Arabic, philosophy is named Umm al -Ulum. It's the mother of sciences. Exactly. You agree? I would definitely agree with that. And I would, I would again uh, specify that it is a mother that is, in a way, uh, carrying at all times its children. <laughs> you see? The children are always there with the mother. And but we need her to take good care of them. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, the vision of enlightenment. We are going to discuss this uh, a bit straight after the break. Just a short break and we sure, will be sure. back. Fossil one out. حياكم الله مجددا مشاهدينا الى هذا الحوار الفلسفي مع دكتور كلود سباك وهو استاذ مساعد في الفلسفه رئيس قسم الفلسفه وعلم الاجتماع في جامعه السوربون ابو ظبي دكتور كلود ذا فيجن اوف انلايتمنت ويتش كاريد مودرنيتي انتل ذا 20th سنتشري فيرست ليتس ديفاين انلايتمنت يا سو ذات واز ا بارت اوف ماي بيبر ذس مورنينغ تراينغ تو understand what was the, mes the message of enlightenment. And for that, I, I centered on the philosophy of uh, Immanuel Kant, who is one of the famous leading philosophers from the 18th century to have um, talked about enlightenment, especially in one of his important short texts called uh, What is Enlightenment? Was ist Aufklärung? And if one had to, um, to summarize uh, Kant's vision of the Enlightenment. Enlightenment is this moment in history where humanity becomes aware for the first time of the mission that it is invested with, of the task that it has to accomplish. And that task is the task of advancing on the road of scientific knowledge and of moralization. Mm -hmm. That road of, of scientific knowledge and moralization is the, the road of rationalization. We discover ourselves as rational beings that do not receive from tradition or even from uh, religion what we have to do. We have to look for it by our own scientific means mm -hmm. and by our own capacity to think critically, to interrogate the world, to interrogate ourselves in order to correct ourselves and to advance on the road to history of on the road of history towards a goal. And that goal is the full moralization of mankind, the ennoblement of the of the world to make it as much as possible in conformity with the rational plan that we discover thanks to our rational mind. Uh, does it still hold today? I mean, what happened after the 20th century? Well, so now, 
In the 20th century, after the two world wars, a lot of philosophers started realizing or questioning the validity of this vision. If Kant or, and others had been right in thinking that we had at last reached a point of history where we were awakening to our moral destination, how come we live in a world with so much violence? How come we live in a world that, that not only still has a lot of divisions, but where those divisions seem to be widening, seem to be deepening? Uh, hadn't Kant foreseen that history was going towards a rational movement of unification where cultural, civilizational differences were going to be overcome more and more within a rational, political, cosmopolitan world order marked by more and more peace, justice and freedom. And in the 20th century, after the, in the aftermath of the, the two world wars, many, more, many people were questioning whether really we, the, the, the vision of the Enlightenment could really hold in, in light of these um, perils. And today, I think we still live in this kind of situation of where we are questioning the enlightenment in, in light, <laughs> precisely, of uh, such perils as the environmental crisis. And what is perhaps new today is that, you see, in the 20th century, people didn't question the the vision of the Enlightenment itself. What they questioned was the application. Was it going to work? Now, today, I think, more and more, you have this idea that maybe the triumph of rationality itself carries something irrational. Rationality can lead for some kind of strange mot motives that we need to philosophers to think. Rationality can transform itself into an irrational plan. For instance, the, ex the technological exploitation of nature, mm -hmm. is, that, is that not something irrational when it goes beyond a limit? Well, where, where is that limit? Can we, can we find, can we think about that limit and can we circumscribe it? It seems that to exploit nature is, is necessary to a certain extent because you need to have, you need to produce goods that are necessary for mankind in order to live better. But at, after what stage does it, does it become a frenzy that is leading the whole of, of our environment to the potential situation of a catastrophe? Mm -hmm. And so these questions are very, very actual, are very present today in, in our um, contemporary uh, uh, configuration, I think. Um, actually, I've quoted this from your paper as well. Uh, German philosopher Immanuel Kant said that because of the unsociable sociability of mankind, conflict is always there, but it pushes us to collaborate and to improve our skills. What did he mean exactly by that? Yeah, you see, so that idea is central to Kant. It's also central in Hegel's philosophy. It's the idea that conflicts, oppositions, divisions, force human beings to cooperate, force human beings to improve themselves in order to resolve those conflicts. And within this moment of negativity, there is something positive that can come out of that. Mm -hmm. Kant uses an, a nice um, metaphor, which is the metaphor of what goes on in a forest, where you have trees growing together in, an, in a way that can be a bit chaotic, anarchic, and so trees are pushing each other and, and growing like this until the moment where they, they don't understand because they don't think that it's, it, it happens in a, in a natural way. They start pushing, growing in, in a straight line towards, towards uh, the sky in order to find the light uh, upwards. And so that's a nice illustration that Kant finds to show that in these antagonisms, there is an incentive that can be uh, unconscious, uh, but that has now become conscious for us in the Enlightenment, where we understand that antagonisms are useful in order to allow for this movement of progress 
to occur. Now, the whole question, of course, which is our question today, is whether there can be a sense in which there are antagonisms that, far from leading to a movement of progress, can push us down into the abyss. And that's, I think, the, the most crucial and difficult question that post-modern philosophers mm -hmm. uh, and post-modernity at large has to think about. But you've highlighted that science becomes a slave to technology. Could you please further elaborate the statement? Yeah, um, that was a, a part of um, the paper where um, I, I talked about the concept of technoscience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I referred to a French philosopher who passed away, unfortunately, recently called Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour, who, who didn't invent this concept, but who uses it. Technoscience refers to this moment when science is, not, is no longer sought for for itself. After all, isn't science valuable for its own sake? And where science that makes possible applications, technological applications, becomes more and more subject and enslaved to those applications until a point where it is the technological demands that require science to adapt to them. And so that's um, a moment when one can feel that what should be second becomes the first. Technology should follow from science, and now we have technology but leading science. No, but what, let's take it other way around. Now technology contributed in a lot of scientific discoveries, and we cannot deny this fact. And uh, that's where you are extremely, you're putting the finger on what is most important. For a very long time, this, this march hand in hand of science and technology seemed to be perfect because, of course, technology was improving the quality of human life. Since the 19th century, since the 20th century, thinkers, for instance, in Marxist theory, also in the Frankfurt School that was uh, influenced by Marxist theory, started noticing that technology is not only improving our lives. To some extent, our lives are becoming more and more invaded by the, the demands of technology. Mm -hmm. We are more and more becoming consumers. We are more and more becoming producers. We are constrained by the technological laws of production where we have to work in, in factories. You probably know Charlie Chaplin's film, The Modern Times, yes. which is a nice illustration of that, of how human lives through labor, but also through leisure, have become uh, more and more alienated, which is the Marxist uh, concept, in, where we are in a process of estrangement. We do not recognize ourselves anymore, or all the time, let's say, we don't all the time recognize ourselves in the world of technology. Another uh, Marxist thinker called uh, Lukacs uh, co um, coined the word reification. We feel like we are becoming the things of uh, reification comes from the Latin res, which means thing in Latin. And so we feel sometimes that we are no longer the subjects of technology. We are not, no longer the users of technology, but we are being used by technology. We are no longer fully the masters of our lives. So coming back to your question, that's where the problem lies today. On the one hand, technology seems not only inevitable, but worthy of praise. We just come out of a pandemic with of COVID, isn't the medical technology that which precisely has been able to save so many lives through the sure. vaccine? Don't we need to be thankful to technology? And of course we do. But on the other hand, there's this problem that I have been talking about. So again, there is an ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And that ambivalence has, can be seen, can be traced back to the ambivalence of rationality itself, probably. So that's where my, my talk was trying to situate the coordinates of the philosophical coordinates of the problem of our contemporary times. But again, these coordinates were already set by 20th century thinking, I would mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. Throughout history, philosophy claims to be the seeking of the truth. However, it has been proven that philosophers utilized philosophy to prove their own point of view. <laughs> what do you think? 
Yeah, well, that's the question. Why are there many philosophies? <laughs> Why does each philosopher has, have his own or her own philosophy? How, isn't, that, isn't philosophy the, the place of war between philosophers? Yeah, that's a question that is old, like, that goes back to Plato. <laughs> and I would say that one answer to that is to say that, it is to show that it's exactly the same in science. There are scientific schools, there are competing theories that have to clash with each other. And again, going back to what we were talking about, the conflictuality that is positive for reason, well, it is through the clash of theories, it is through the, the, the conflict between different point of, points of view that the overall movement towards the truth can pick from different theories can look for what is common to different competing theories in order to advance towards more, a more unified uh, standpoint. So the truth would be not to be certain what a given philosopher thinks or another philosopher thinks, but the trend, the philosophical trend mm -hmm. that, that, that is exactly. the outcome of these confrontations, I would mm -hmm. say. Exactly. Thank you very much, Dr. Claude Spark. I'm really very much pleased and honored to have shared these philosophical concepts with you. Thank you for being with us on Fujaira TV. Thank you very much. التلاقح الثقافي يبقى أداة ناجعة لإحداث التغيير الإيجابي في البناء الفكري للإنسان وتغيير النشاط العقلي الفضولي. دمتم بخير.